Okay, everyone, uh, welcome. Um, the This is the last day and also probably the most exciting day at topics of the um, the CDTI workshop on analytical foundations of deep learning. Um, and also, again, we would like to use this opportunity to thank the support from CDTI and also all the staff like Larry and all the uh, technician has helped us with uh, uh, running this very successful workshop so far. And uh, today's is a slightly different. Uh, it, instead of a regular tutorial or uh, invited uh, presentations, we have a new format of uh, brainstorming and discussion, really that um, uh, trying to provide the opportunity for the communities uh, and who are interested in various topics uh, related to deep learning to come together and uh, maybe reach some consensus or, uh, or no consensus whatsoever about what uh, exciting topics, problems, open directions we would uh, embark on in the next few years. And we have uh, three fantastic uh, sessions organized by um, one is on the, the first one will be on uh, the robustness and um, uh, organized by Edgar uh, Dobrenban from University of uh, Pennsylvania. And the second one um, will be on fairness and privacy, organized by Gita Kutiniak uh, and also Guillermo Shapiro. And the last session will be on architecture design, uh, organized by um, Benjamin Hefele uh, of Johns Hopkins University and Chong Yu of University of California, Berkeley. So without any further ado, I will pass the baton to um, Edgar. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Yi. Um, so hi, so I'm uh, Edgar uh, Dobriban in the statistics department at Penn. And so this is um, a session on robustness, uh, also known as what are the important problems in this area? And so just a few introductory comments. Um, for a very long time, maybe hundreds of years, uh, robustness has been an important desired property in statistics and data science. And more recently, uh, the, the test time robustness of very complex prediction models and systems have become of a great interest. For instance, uh, deep nets have been shown to be quite vulnerable to uh, test time adversarial perturbations. And this is a super exciting and very fast evolving field so um, uh, as somebody like you know myself who is uh, perhaps just getting started and has some work in this area or you know other people who are interested uh, it's not that easy to know what are the important problems and so the goal here is to bring together some of the leading experts and their teams to brainstorm and discuss the state of the art and due to the time limit unfortunately we will only able to have a very small number just 11 uh, speakers but and, and and so there are many important uh, teams who have made you know really great great contributions that we weren't you know just they they, they aren't uh, speaking right now. But we welcome your contributions offline, and we are potentially interested to compile things into a document to serve the community. And uh, thanks for uh, you know Yi and Zitong and Yao Dong for uh, helping out with various um, issues. So we have uh, great speakers whose names are listed here. And I'll go, um, uh, we will go in some order for them. Um, and roughly speaking, we have uh, two maybe broad uh, topics. One of them is the uh, so called learning with distance based attacks. Roughly speaking, not, you know, not necessarily very particularly. Um, uh, and then uh, beyond these distance based robustness, uh, these are the topics. So, in the interest of time, um, I'd like to go ahead and get started with the first uh, talk that is given by Michael Goldblum. So Michael is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Maryland working with uh, Tom Goldstein. And uh, today he will talk about how to use um, robustness, uh, 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 robustness beyond just uh, the classical uh, classical attack and defense setting. Adversary driven methods beyond attack and defense. So please. Thanks, Edgar. 
All right, so a lot of early work on adversarial attacks focus on revealing interesting properties of neural networks and potential security vulnerabilities. And since then, this whole community has emerged studying theoretical properties, defenses, stronger attacks, and all sorts of applications. And I wanna focus on a new direction of applying some of these methods to areas completely outside of robustness altogether. All right, the first, work I wanna talk about is on fingerprinting. And the fingerprinting problem goes like this. Companies have their own proprietary neural network models and users can access these models often through some sort of API access. And companies are worried that someone will query their model a bunch of times and then steal it. So companies are worried about model theft. And there are a couple of ways you could try to deal with this. You could try to maybe poison the outputs of your model so that anyone who trains on them is going to have some problems in their model. And another, another direction you could go in is if you see another competitor company has some really good model, how do you see, tell if their model is just a stolen version of your own model? So kind of a post hoc analysis of if someone's model is stolen. And the solution proposed to this is conferable adversarial examples in which the stolen models and the origin mo original model are vulnerable to the same adversarial examples, but um, independently trained models are not vulnerable to those adversarial examples. So you can just plug in, even in a black box setting, your adversarial examples, and based on the output of the model, you can tell if it's stolen or not. So the pipeline looks like this. It's, it's pretty simple. You just have a, a ensemble of reference models, which are independently trained. They're not stolen. You have your own proprietary source model, and then you have some stolen models that you create yourself, an ensemble of them. And when you craft your adversarial attack, you just have a few loss terms, and they say the reference models should classify them correctly, um, whereas the source and surrogate models should not. And so it's creating adversarial examples that specifically are not transferable to other models that aren't stolen. And um, importantly, it turns out that this is robust to fine tuning and pruning. If someone tries to change their model a little bit to avoid getting um, caught, um, they still, these, these adversarial examples still transfer to those modified stolen models, but not to independently trained models. And this has blown previous fingerprinting methods out of the water and um, seems to be quite robust to the sorts of, um, the sorts of model modifications that people have tried. All right, now I wanna talk about data augmentation. And this is outside of the robustness regime. You're not trying to improve adversarial robustness, but performance on different tasks. So a big problem is that we have so many types of data augmentation now. And if you wanna accomplish some task, how do you choose what combinations of data augmentations? There are reinforcement learning approaches that have been proposed to this, like auto augment, but they're extremely expensive um, on the order sometimes of thousands of GPU hours. And, um, and you wanna, so, so you wanna choose a combination of data augmentations that's gonna be effective without having to spend thousands of GPU hours. So a recent proposed method called MaxUp proposes that you sample a bunch of, for each batch during training, you sample a bunch of augmentations and you choose the ones that maximize loss. And this is much cheaper than RL approaches. It does multiply your training time by a few times, depending on how many augmentations you try each batch. And it actually improves state-of-the-art accuracy on ImageNet over auto-augment. So it does better than auto-augment and is simultaneously a lot, a lot faster. Um, so now I wanna move into a slightly different field, meta-learning, which has lots of opportunities for augmentation, much more than classical image classification because you have support data, query data, you have tasks and you have few shot data. And, um, and you might augment all these differently. And it turns out that if, if you wanna do best, you wanna augment them each differently. And so it's a really hard computational problem. RL approaches are gonna be extremely expensive, but it turns out that MaxUp actually works very well and you can improve um, performance on popular benchmarks by really, really large margins by using MaxUp in, in meta-learning with a lot of different data augmentations. All right, and finally, I wanna talk about domain generalization. So um, 
so it's well known that neural networks break under domain shifts. And so people work on domain adaptation where you have some new domain shifted data and you wanna adapt a pre-trained network to that. But another goal is to make networks that will simultaneously perform well on training the training distribution as well as domain shifts. So as an observation, shifting feature statistics, like the feature statistics you track in batch normalization um, simulates roughly domain shifts. And so in this panel of images, we take the features in some layer of, of, the, of a neural network and we adversarially perturb their feature statistics and then put them through a decoder, the new features through a decoder. And we see sometimes, so on the bottom left, you see domain shifts where you remove textures, you change hues, and sometimes you see very wacky images on the bottom right. And so we propose adversarial batch normalization in which you adversarially trained on adversarially perturbed feature statistics instead of on adversarially perturbed images. And um, you can think about this intuitively as preparing for worst case domain shifts, at least domain shifts, which can be simulated by perturbing feature statistics. And it turns out that this improves domain generalization significantly in real domain shifts, such as making cartoon versions of images or stylized images or Instagram filters on, on various um, vision tasks, including classification, but also semantic segmentation. All right, thanks. Thanks, uh, Michael. And so I wanted to add about the format, which I turns out uh, forgot. So we will have a sort of spotlight lightning talks, right? Uh, 11 talks of uh, five minutes each. And we will have a panel at the end. Uh, you can, anybody can submit questions for the panel either via the chat right here or via the Google form that I just put in there. And because it's five minutes, I will actually, I may interrupt you that it's five minutes. And now, you know, we are like two minutes uh, behind the schedule because of my long uh, uh, presentation, uh, long, uh, you know, explanation here. But in any case, uh, we have some buffer. So uh, thanks again, Michael, that's great. great. And our next speaker is um, Zico Coulter, uh, who is a associate professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon and one well figure in adversarial robustness. All right, so I'm going to talk today. I'm going to talk actually very briefly. We can be very quick about this. So hopefully I'll try to get us back on schedule about uh, robustness. And in particular, you know, we do a lot of work in robustness. Um, but there's a big difference between the theory. And I actually really shouldn't say theory there. I, should, I guess I should sort of say, you know, the, the, the mathematical frameworks we use for robustness versus the expectations people have for robustness. Um, <clears throat> so what we mean by robustness typically is that we want to find some classifier that works in some sense for worst case perturbations of data, right? So you have data that's perturbed in some threat model. Oftentimes this is an LP ball um, and you're allowed to sort of vary your points in that ball and you want the, the classifier to perform well, no matter kind of how badly an adversary perturbs your points in these balls. And this is actually, a, I mean, there's some great things about this problem. And I, to be clear, I'm not trying to uh, minimize this problem at all because uh, it's still unsolved, I guess, is the, this is the biggest thing about it. We still don't really know how to solve this problem. Um, and so despite, despite all the massive work in this area, uh, we still don't really have a great handle on this. Um, you know, as we all know, kind of robust performance lags way, way behind uh, clean accuracy on classifiers. And I think it's, while there are some necessary trade-offs, I think actually other speakers are gonna talk about this, it's still kind of an interesting question. Uh, but <clears throat> separate from this, if you ask kind of a practitioner, or I guess maybe a customer would be the right word, uh, what they mean when they say they want their machine learning system to be robust, what they actually mean is that the system should work really well kind of no matter what, um, which to be clear is not how machine learning works. I'm gonna put that on the next slide as well. But this is the sort of normal interpretation of what robustness means. It means it should handle kind of edge cases gracefully and, and just kind of always work, I guess. This <laughs> seems to be the thing we kind of run up into. Um, and while I don't think this, this second thing is really a realistic um, target for machine learning systems, of course, um, I think there are some ways in which we can actually leverage some of the techniques we've been developing in our, uh, in our work on, on um, robustness actually improve kind of this, this perspective. So um, in particular, um, I think we can think about moving, and, and actually I should mention there are plenty of other talks as well. So I know that Alex is gonna talk about something similar, I believe. 
Um, but I think we can think about moving robustness beyond uh, simple threat models like LP pulls. And while I think that the ultimate goal of kind of having robustness that deals with human semantic similarity kind of as the threat model, um, that, that might be probably actually impossible to ever get to, but there are ways in which we can start to move towards there. Um, and so I just want to point a few uh, bits of our recent work in this in this direction. So uh, a year ago or so, feels like ages ago now, <laughs> just a year, it was just last ICML, uh, we had a paper on uh, Wasserstein adversarial examples. And this is you know capturing, I think this is still a pretty limited class to be clear, but it's capturing a slightly larger class of perturbations, um, or at least not larger, a different class of perturbations that maybe more naturally reflect some of the underlying uh, sort of perturbations you would expect images to be able to handle, like translation and rotation. And then more recently, um, my, my former student now, uh, Eric Wong, oh, oh. Uh, my former student, Eric Wong, uh, worked on, has done some work on learning perturbation sets for robust machine learning. So the idea here is you actually learn a generator, which takes an image um, as well as a, a, a random vector and produces perturbations of this image from there. And then the nice thing about this is you can actually leverage um, traditional adversarial training to train over a LP ball in this latent variable, which ends up giving you robustness to semantic perturbations through the process of this generator here. So the last thing I want to highlight is that I'm the, the, the sort of common thread about both these things is that they aren't ignoring uh, LP robustness. Rather, I think we can actually start to exploit what we know about LP robustness. Um, as well as the fact that we have very powerful networks uh, to augment data and things like this, to actually start moving beyond kind of simple robustness uh, threat models and actually get to not not to the, the practitioner or not to the you know customer's goal maybe, but at least move uh, robustness towards this goal of actually making systems that, that that are robust, kind of to under some sort of human uh, perception and semantic similarity. And that's it. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Zico. It's really great. Uh, let's uh, move uh, on to uh, Aditi uh, Raghunathan, who is a PhD uh, student at Stanford working with Percy Liang and John Lucci, and we'll be talking about going beyond XY pairs for robustness. Hi, everyone. And I guess Zico's talk was like a pretty a perfect segue and very related to what I'm also going to talk about. Um, yeah, so I guess mine is also like extremely high level and like very brief. And I'm just trying to give my perspective on how maybe as you're making this journey, like, you know, from these IID benchmarks, machine learning system to like actually deploying them in the wild or like Zika said to like customer satisfaction, like maybe you want to rethink sort of the paradigm or sort of like how we are approaching these problems. Um, so like the gender robustness problem is we want like, you know, some sort of performance that uh, is good even when the test distribution is not the same as train. And like, there's been a lot of, you know, different different settings of like how the train and test distributions could vary. And for, unfortunately for most of these definitions, we know that current systems are fragile. Uh, but then now when we look at sort of what methods we use typically at this point to be robust. So most of them are still, you know, like we've identified uh, like these LP balls or like, you know, some subpopulation shifts or like spurious correlations and things like that, that are currently broken in the model. And then we try to fix it. And it seems like most of these methods, like, you know, still try to commit to the paradigm of ERM and sort of, you know, have a network and like, you know, you take these data points, you take some label and then you change like small, small changes to this training paradigm and then try to uh, get robustness in terms of fixing these things that are broken. And so the sort of question that I want to raise in general that might be worth thinking about as we work on these problems is like when we want to think about the overarching goal of getting general robustness, like, you know, should we feel committed to this paradigm or like, is it worth trying to like move past this? And so here's a very simplistic sort of my own, like, you know, way of putting things in perspective is sort of like what approaches we have right now. And so here's a, a nice visualization of like, uh, like robust and non-robust features of that I'm borrowing from Elias et al. So you could think of abstractly as like, you know, there are different patterns that exist in your data set and your model tries to use like any of these different patterns to make a prediction. And if you just have some data points and some labels, like you don't have a lot of control over what these mo this model actually uses to make predictions. And in particular, there are all these sort of non-robust features that, you know, are some mostly predictive within the data said within your training distribution, but they're not always predictive and then don't generally hold on test distribu uh, shifted test distributions. And, and so you want to make a model avoid using these non-robust features. 
And so we can think of, you know, adversarial training and like, you know, these LP balls are like even more fancier, like, you know, one sustain balls or things like that. As basically these perturbations try to flip some of these non-robust features and you do that on your training set and hopefully your model learns to, you know, you know ignore these non-robust features. So we identify some ball that like flips some non-robust features and that's why the model gets confused. But like, you know, we as humans are like, you know, the ground truth shouldn't change and we're giving this signal to the model. Um, Another like approach that like you know many people in Stanford that are currently looking at is basically like you know subpopulations. So instead of just having an image and then you know perturbing it, you could think of shifts in terms of just the data points itself. So you could have different subpopulations in your data set, and you want to be robust to like shifts in these populations. So if you think of constructing you know say a group that has like these non where these non-robust features do not exist, like you know either the background is actually not spuriously correlated or like you know you don't want to use gender, and so that is like a subpopulation that your model could. Have have used and you know gotten bad error and so what another approach to like you know make your models not use these non-robust features is to construct these groups where these non-robust features are absent and really incentivize your model to focus on such subpopulations so these are sort of two of the things that like i'm most familiar with in terms of what we know on how, how to be robust and both these uh, approaches in general share like one important thread that the knowledge of what is robust or non-robust comes from sort of the humans are the experts. So like we construct these LP balls appropriately, or we construct these groups using our notion of you know, what should be robust versus not. And so like, you know, is this sufficient or do we actually want to go beyond this? So we could think of like, you know, having better and better sort of non-robust features. We keep finding things and break, uh, you know, by breaking systems and then fixing them, but maybe we could think of an alternate approach as well. So in general, like it feels like there's a lot of potential when we, you know, go beyond these X Y pairs and think about richer sources of supervision. And like for example, unlabeled data, like we've all, even for like these classical like you know LP problems or like uh, subpopulation chips, like unlabeled data is very powerful. And we could try to think about, you know, like whether you could infer more general notions of robustness directly from unlabeled data. Um, and then you could also just have multiple heterogeneous data sources, including multiple modes. And so maybe having you know, different tasks or different modes would help your model automatically infer like what are features that it actually uses that are present in all these you know, different modes or different environments and then pick those features appropriately. Um, but then this would also require some strong assumptions on sort of you know, what diversity your data should have. And so like maybe the best thing to do is allow your agent itself to collect the data and hopefully like train your model to like, collect data in a way that it can infer so what is actually robust and what is not. This is of course much more expensive than you know, someone giving you a label data set, but maybe this is somewhat necessary when we want to get general robustness. And so just to begin on that a little bit more, like you know, can we get your model itself to like figure out what data points that it should you know, label to like really understand what is robust versus not you know, in, in an active learning or like an interactive setup. And more classically, this is kind of related to causal interventions where you know, there is a classical, uh, you know, uh, knowledge that we have that we can't learn like purely from just correlational data and maybe we are bottlenecked by that when we have like you know committed to a fixed training and uh, training data set and so if we can go beyond that by allowing the agent to like collect data as it requires like maybe we, we can actually hope to go beyond um, sort of fixed notions of robustness that come from the human's definition. Um, yeah, so I guess this is just sort of my perspective and maybe it's worth keeping in mind that we are not necessarily committed to like this particular setting and might be like we get we can get a lot of leverage by going beyond that, especially when we want general notions of robustness. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you uh, Aditi for bringing those perspectives. Um, and um, so let's uh, <clears throat> go on to uh, Alex uh, Rogi, our next uh, speaker. So Alex is a PhD candidate at Penn in electrical engineering, where he is advised by uh, Ahmed Hassani and George Papas. Today I'll be talking about robustness against natural shift in data. Please, Alex. Okay. Thanks, Edgar. Thanks for organizing. Um, and thanks also to Zico and Adidu who really set me up well uh, for this talk. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about robustness against natural out of distribution shifts in data. And so to start things off, I'm just going to say a couple of things about the perturbation based robustness model. So in this model, uh, we think about um, threats that arise due to adding small amounts of norm bounded and possibly adversarially chosen no noise to our data. And this has been shown to cause high rates of misclassification in a number of applications. And in particular, in this field, we know that at least up until now, there's been a lot of great work that's tried to develop the theory 
and also practical algorithms that can be used to resolve these sorts of security threats that arise from adversarial artificial tampering with the data. Um, but of course, on the other hand, we know that there are also a lot of common naturally occurring transformations of data uh, that are very frequent in kind of more real world applications and that also cannot be described by this norm bounded perturbation based additive model of adversarial examples. So for example, you might run into something like a spatial transformation, like a rotation or scaling. You might see adversarially chosen patches, or you might have a domain shift problem, um, such as these kind of problems that we've already seen already today. Or you might have something that's called natural variation, which broadly speaking encompasses things such as changes in weather conditions and images. And so the question is, given that um, adversarial examples have been shown to be a, a very big source of fragility for deep learning, is it also true that deep learning is vulnerable to these sorts of natural outer distribution transformations of data like I have on the right side of this slide? And so to answer this question, um, let's set up a really simple experiment. So let's first try training a classifier on the well-known ImageNet data set. And then let's now evaluate this classifier on different test sets from ImageNet C. Now, if you're not familiar with it, ImageNet C is just a new data set that comprises a collection of test sets for ImageNet, uh, where each test set has a different sort of natural transformation or corruption. So for example, there's one test set corresponding to snow. There's one test set that kind of changes the levels of contrast in the images. There's a test set for brightness, and there's also another test set for something like foggy weather conditions. And so what we see is when we train this classifier on ImageNet, and then we evaluate it on these subsets of ImageNet C, uh, we get accuracies of around 20, 30, or 40 percent. And this stands kind of in stark contrast to what we would see if we were to evaluate our trained classifier on the original ImageNet test set, where we would get something like 80 percent test accuracy. So this is really demonstrating just in one experiment that when we apply simple common transformations to our data, we get large drops in, in classification accuracy. And so at least empirically, the answer to this question that I have at the top of the screen is yes. And this has been shown in a number of, of very recent work. Deep learning is vulnerable to these sorts of natural transformations of data. And so given that this fragility seems to exist, the question is, well, are there any solutions for this problem? And today I'm gonna to talk about a first step toward solving this problem using a paradigm that we're calling model-based robust deep learning. And in particular, there are three main steps of this paradigm that we're introducing. So the first step is to model a wide range of these sorts of natural phenomena using a mechanism we call models of natural variation. So at a high level, a model of natural variation is just a function G that takes as input an image X and some nuisance parameter delta, which you can think about as like a low dimensional vector and outputs a new image X prime with a different level of uh, these kind of natural conditions in the output image. So for example, this model is capturing changes in snow. And in this kind of framework, this parameter delta is controlling how much variation is kind of added to the output image, similar to kind of these perturbation sets that Zico was talking about. Uh, so Delta controls, for example, in this case, how much snow is added to the output image. In the second step, we formulate a robust optimization problem that seeks to kind of leverage this model of natural variation to train neural networks to be robust against the source of natural variation or the changes induced by this model. So in this problem, the inner maximization problem is over this nuisance parameter that controls how much natural variation or how many changes are added to the image. And uh, the outer problem is just a minimization of the risk over the weights of some neural network. And then finally, in the third step, we're looking to devise algorithms for solving this kind of challenging optimization problem. So you might consider doing gradient descent on the inner problem, and you might consider doing gradient descent on the outer problem. But in general, we need efficient ways of solving this problem. And so given this paradigm, if we return to the experiment that I had two slides ago on ImageNet, where we're training on ImageNet and we're testing on ImageNet C, what we find is that when we solve this model-based optimization uh, problem using this gradient-based scheme, we can improve maybe by between 20 or 10 and 20 percent uh, on these challenging test sets. But of course, we're not yet close to achieving this kind of 80 percent figure that we would get on clean data, which leads us into the question of what are the open problems in this kind of space? 
And the first one, uh, which I think is quite clear, is that we need good ways of solving this optimization problem or the similar optimization problem that, that Zigo talked about. Um, because this is kind of one way that you might think about uh, formulating this problem. But more generally, we need ways of, of new ways of formulating the problem of robustness against these kinds of natural outer distribution shifts. And finally, uh, the last thing that I wanna bring up is that we need to figure out ways to go beyond image classification to apply these notions of robustness to fields like reinforcement learning or semantic segmentation, because these are the domains where these kinds of natural transformations of data are most likely to pop up. And so with that, I just wanna thank everyone for having me um, and point you uh, a link to our paper which has kind of a longer discussion of what I've talked about today. Um, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Alex, <clears throat> for the great uh, presentation uh, out of distribution shifts. <clears throat> and uh, so our next speaker is Chong Yu from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, in slight uh, shifting gears uh, related to uh, robustness in low dimensional models or real low dimensional models. Please, Chong. All right, so thank you for the introduction. So I would like to share uh, our perspective on robustness and in particular, uh, we aim to obtain this kind of guaranteed robustness uh, from the perspective of uh, low dimensional models. So the uh, argument here is that there is no lack of guaranteed robustness if we look back in history, right? And this dates back to at least in the year 1965 where there is this work in the area of uh, signal processing and signal recovery, which says that you can basically recover these kind of unlimited uh, signals from the corrupted environments. And since then, there has been a lot of work on extending such a framework to a lot of applications, and in particular in machine learning, you know, this kind of method are extended to face recognition and uh, in low rank recovery uh, problems. So let me give you a little bit of more details of those works, right? So um, this work is uh, a work on the task of signal recovery, and this is something known as the Logan's phenomenon, where the goal here is that we want to recover this band limited uh, signal uh, from the measurement Y, but this measurement Y is corrupted by some uh, sparse corruption vector denoted as uh, E0 here. So you can think of this as like the signal is uh, in a sense sparse in the frequency domain, while the corruption is sparse in the time domain, right? And then there has been this result that says that if the span of the corruption in the time domain denoted by T, right? Uh, give me a second. Yeah. And then the span of the signal in the frequency domain, as long as their product is smaller than uh, pi over two, then you're good. You can recover this underlying signal by solving this kind of complex and sparse optimization problem, right? So, and uh, a way to interpret such result is basically to say that this is, oh my God. Uh, a kind of, how can I, okay, this is a kind of a incoherence condition, right, in the sense that uh, the, you know, the, the signal and the corruption should be incoherent. And then the second example is in the case of face recognition, and here this is a method based on sparse representation, where we uh, write these target face uh, images uh, to be, uh, like, recognized using a bunch of other training images. Um, and the, the goal here is that we want to recover this X0 and the E0, which are both sparse, right? So in general, if there's no sparse prior, then there's no way that we can recover X0 and E0. But if we have this kind of structures or sparse priors, then the problem becomes tractable. And in fact, you can solve that, or you can like find them by solving this complex optimization problem. Right, again, a, uh, you know, L1 minimization problem. And this again comes with theoretical guarantees for correctness, right? So the, the statement is long, but by and large, it's a incoherent uh, result, uh, condition result, right? Which basically says that as long as your dictionary A that has all the face images and that is incoherent with the uh, sparse corruption, right? Uh, captured by this standard basis here, and then you're good. And then you can recover uh, the underlying sparse and, uh, you know, uh, sparse signal and sparse noise uh, with high probability. So how robust is this method? Uh, we can test that uh, method on uh, this kind of face images, right? So the message here is that if we look at the uh, leftmost column, right, even if the, the face image is highly corrupted as such, still the method is capable of uh, like recovering a underlying clean image and obtaining 
a very good accuracy as shown in, in here by the uh, right curve. So the final example is the example of low rank uh, recovery, right? Where the goal is to recover a low rank matrix from the corrupt environment. So here the message is similar as long as you have some sort of incoherent condition captured by this mu, right? Which captures the incoherence between the low rank component, the, the, the you know the basis for the low rank component and the sparse component, and then you're good. And then the you know the low rank matrix can be recovered by solving this comma combination problem. So what are the open problems? So in all this result that I've been talking about, right? So they are kind of assuming this kind of simple linear modeling or like sparse or low rank under this uh, simple linear modeling. Uh, and in those cases, we can see that we can recover those uh, signals uh, under incoherent conditions. But in practice, we're more interested in perhaps in this uh, more complicated signal, right? And in this case, we're gonna need uh, complicated nonlinear transformations to model such, uh, you know, uh, complicated structure. And the question for us is really how can we uh, like recover um, uh, this kind of NNN signal and how do we characterize such incoherence conditions? So last 10 seconds. So just a bit of uh, application, right? So this kind of framework can be applied to this kind of classification or recovery task where, you know, the corruption could be label corruptions or like corruptions in the image. And in the latter case, we have a recent uh, work that, you know, show how to address that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John, for sharing the perspective of Lorent models. And <clears throat> our uh, next speaker is Sebastian Bubek from uh, Microsoft Research, who is a prominent researcher in theoretical machine learning and uh, also in uh, robustness. So please, uh, uh, Sebastian. Thanks, Edgar. OK, so I will try to go fast so that we have time for one or two quick questions. If we don't have time for questions, uh, you can just put your questions in the chat and I will monitor it and try to answer. Uh, so this is joint work with Yuanju Li and Diraj Nagaraj. And uh, what, we, what we did in this paper is that we tried to posit that overparametrization is actually a law of robustness for neural networks. And I use the physics terminology of a law because I think it's, it's something very, very general and also because we can't actually prove it. So it's only a conjecture at this point. So I'm going to tell you what is the conjecture exactly. So we are talking about uh, two layers neural network. These are functions that map a vector x in Rd to the following linear combination. So what you do is you have k neurons. Okay, so k is going to denote the number of neurons. What is a neuron? A neuron is a vector, wl in Rd, a bias term bl. What the neuron computes is the affine map wl dot x plus bl. Then it applies a nonlinearity psi. Okay, so psi is just some fixed nonlinearity from the real line to the real line. Okay, we fix it uh, once and for all. So this is the output of the else neuron, and then we recombine those outputs linearly. So we do the sum for L equals one to K of AL psi of WL dot X plus BL. And let me call FK of psi, this set of functions that is representable by uh, K neurons and one hidden layer. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Generic data, some of the things can be generalized, but this is uh, what I want to be talking about. So what is generic data? So we have a data set X of pairs X, I, Y, I. To simplify, the Y, I are just going to be in minus one plus one. Okay, so it's just binary classification. And the X, I, I normalize them to a unit norm. Okay, so they are just, they live on the sphere. And what I mean by generic is that it's IID uniformly random. Okay, so the label is random, the X, I is also random. So what is known uh, for now, three decades is the following theorem. You can interpolate such a data set. So what do I mean by interpolate? I mean, there exists a function f in fk of psi such that f of xi is equal to yi. Okay, so there exists a one hidden layer neural network that exactly fits your data perfectly as long as the following condition, k times d is larger than n. Okay, so that makes sense because k times d is the number of uh, parameters to describe a two layers neural network up to some constant. So what you want is the number of degrees of freedom to be larger than the number of equations that you're trying to fit. So as soon as this happens, there exists an f in fk of psi. This theorem is true. So again, with high probability, I'm not gonna uh, care about the with high probability in this uh, five minutes talk. Uh, and also it's true for any psi which is non-polynomial. Okay, but let's fix some psi that you have in mind. So the question that we want to ask is a big question um, is what if in addition to interpolating the data, we also want to be smooth. 
Okay, so we also want, not only do we want to interpolate, but we want the Lipschitz constant to be of order one, meaning that if we change an X by a little bit, then the output also change by a little bit. What, what are the consequences of this assumption? So this is exactly what is the cost of robustness. So what's easy to see in this setting is that as long as K is larger than N, so if the number of neurons, if you have one neuron per data point, then you can interpolate and you can do so smoothly. Okay, but this is much bigger. Note k times k larger than n is much bigger than this one, which is k larger than n over d. Okay, so k larger than n, it's a d times over parameterization. You, you have a network which is d times larger, so much, much, much bigger. And now the key thing is our conjecture that we make in this paper is the following. For any neural network that interpolates, for any neural network such that f of xi is equal to y for any i in, uh, from one to n, with high probability, the following holds the Lipschitz constant on the sphere, but you don't have to worry about on the sphere. If you want, just think about the Lipschitz constant. The Lipschitz constant is larger than square root n over k. n is the number of data points, k is the number of neurons. So let's just two, take two extreme cases. If we want the Lipschitz constant to be, to be O of one, then this conjecture implies that k needs to be larger than n. So if you want to be Lipschitz, this conjecture implies that overparameterization is absolutely necessary. On the other hand, if you want to have an optimal size neural network, meaning k is like n over d, then necessarily the Lipschitz constant must grow like square root d, so very non-Lipschitz. Okay, I will stop here and take, maybe we have time for one or two questions. Okay, if there is no question, I can, I can ask a quick question. What, in what setting have you proved this? Have you proved a special case of this or something? Yeah, excellent. So uh, we proved the following three results. First one is we know this conjecture to be true for a certain proxy on the Lipschitz constant. So if you don't control the exact Lipschitz constant, but you control an upper bound on the Lipschitz constant, which depends on the spectral norm of the matrix that corresponds to the first layer, then the conjecture is true. But this is only an upper bound. It doesn't take into account some possible cancellations. That's the first result. Second result is for the rectified linear unit, we know this conjecture to be true when n is of order g, okay? So it's a very, very special case. And what we know exactly is we know for the ReLU network, a lower bound of square root d over k. But d over k is very, very fundamentally different phenomenon because square root d over k doesn't say anything non-trivial when k is larger than d. What does it mean? It's the overcomplete regime. As soon as your neurons, they span the entire space, then our lower bound of square root d over k doesn't say anything. So these two results are kind of very, very easy. And then the third one is more interesting. It's also easy, but it's deeper. It's that if you have a polynomial network, then we know the conjecture to be true in the extreme regime, which is as follows. Take a polynomial network, so it cannot fit any data, but it can fit some data up to a certain point. So now take a data set, which is as large as possible so that you can still fit with polynomial network. Then the conjecture is true in the optimal size regime, which is K equals N over T. So when k is equal to n over d, and n is as large as possible for the polynomial, for the power of the polynomial that you have, then the Lipschitz constant must be larger than square root d. And this is the most interesting of the three results. It's connected to some properties about tensors. And this is all we know. And none of these really touches on the real deep question. So the real deep question is completely open. Uh, can I ask a quick question, if there's yes. time? Uh, so how does it, very interesting result. So how does it uh, relate to uh, isoparametric inequalities on the sphere. Uh, can you think about like this as a bound on the epsilon expansion on a set on a sphere? Excellent, excellent. So I want really to emphasize this. So this is about the Lipschitz constant, which is the worst case. Okay, it's the supremum over all points on the on the sphere. You can ask different questions where you ask about what is the average norm of the gradient points. The point is, this is not so well defined because what you can do is you can hide all the non lipschitz in a very, very tiny amount of space. So you can have this very quick variation in very small amount of space. So the expected norm of the gradient can be very, very small. Okay, so it's more about really the supremum. What you can ask, so expected norm of the gradient won't work, but what you can ask is the variance of the norm of the gradient. So the expected norm squared. So then, you know, if you, if you go uh, from zero to one in space delta, then expected norm is going to be constant, but expected norm squared is going to blow up because you're going to get one over delta squared times delta. So you're going to get one over delta. 
So maybe expected norm squared makes sense to ask the question, but I don't know. It could be that the trade-offs are a little bit different. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Is there, is there time for one more question? Uh, why don't we keep the, uh, the panel discussion? Let's just you know, try to uh, uh, go on. And in the panel discussion, there should be more time. So, uh, and uh, the next uh, speaker will be Jingpui Chan. Uh, PhD student at UCLA working with Chen Chen uh, Gu. Hi, so this is Chen Hui Chen from UCLA. And today we'll be talking about some open problems in adversarial robustness. Okay, so the first question is, are adversarial examples inevitable? So we ask this question since even the adversarial trained models are still vulnerable to adversarial examples. And there are actually some pessimistic results from Fozzi et al. and Shafahi et al. basically saying that uh, adversarial examples are inevitable for simple input data distributions, such as Gaussian or uniform. Okay, however, it still remains unknown for the real image distribution, which we care the most. So our recent result actually shows that such pessimistic results do not simply apply to real image distributions. To be more specific, we estimate the maximum achievable robustness bound for real image distributions. So here we show a big GAN generated image net distribution. And we observe that there actually exists a large gap between the robustness achieved by the best robust classifiers currently and our estimated maximum achievable robustness limit. And on the right hand side, we show that our estimated bound is indeed tight as a true robustness, uh, maximum achievable robustness show lie between our bound and the brown and green dots, where the current robust classifiers are represented by the yellow and purple dots. So this suggests that there's actually a large room for further robustness improvement of the current robust classifiers on real image dataset. So now we have seen both sides of this problem, the optimistic side and the pessimistic side, depending on the data distributions. Now, what remains an open problem is that we are still not clear what are the sufficient and necessary conditions on the data distribution such that the adversarial examples are or are not inevitable. And this is the key to understand how data distribution actually affect adversarial robustness here. In the second problem, we are talking about the accuracy robustness trade-off. And since trades, a lot of uh, methods actually show that there is a trade-off between natural accuracy and robustness. Basically, uh, increasing the strength of the robust regularization, uh, which essentially enlarging the lambda in the following formulation here, uh, it will enhance robustness, but it will actually hurt natural accuracy. So our recent result actually shows that uh, the robustness is not actually part of the uh, trade-off. It should be the result of the trade-off. And the true trade-off should be between the natural accuracy and the perturbation stability, which is a new term we proposed to characterize the strength of robust regularization term. To be more specific, let's consider the decomposition of the sample set. So first, let's look at the correctly classified examples, which is easier to understand and it corresponding to the natural accuracy here. So let's denote it with a blue circle below. And next is the interesting part. Uh, we define the exam, uh, stable examples, which refers to examples whose uh, prediction, uh, uh, predictions are the same within the neighborhood. And this corresponding to the perturbation stability here. And let's denote it with the right circle below. And now notice that the robust examples is actually the intersection between uh, correctly classified examples and the stable examples, meaning that an example needs to be both correctly classified and stable in order to be robust. And this, and this uh, robust examples are corresponding to the robust accuracy here. Now let's consider if increasing, if we increase the robust regularization parameter lambda here, what will actually happen is that the perturbation stability will go up, meaning that the, the right circle will become larger and the natural accuracy will go down, meaning that the blue circle will actually become smaller. And finally, the robust accuracy uh, may go up or down uh, depending on how the intersection part changes. So now we have a better characterization of this uh, accuracy robustness trade-off. But the remaining open problem is that what actually causes this trade-off? 
or should we say, um, does the trade-off really exist? So why will we say that? Uh, first, for human eyes, uh, we are actually both robust and accurate. We didn't really experience such kind of uh, trade-off in human eyes. And secondly, uh, in some tasks in NLP, people have proved that uh, adversarial training actually helps natural accuracy. This suggests that um, the such kind of trade-off may not even exist. So maybe this trade-off is just an artifact of the current robust training algorithms on image distribution, uh, image classification tasks. And this problem is also an important question that needs to be answered before we truly understand adversarial robustness here. So that's it. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jingguai, uh, for the presentation. And so in the interest of time, let's go on and uh, ask our questions uh, at the end. Um, so next, uh, we have Omar uh, Montessar from uh, TDIC, uh, who's a PhD student working with Steve Hanneke and Nadi Srebro. Uh, OK, so I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction to adversarial, adversarial uh, robustness. There is some unknown adversary U that we would like to be robust against. Uh, for example, this could be an L infinity ball uh, or an L2 ball, or maybe just some other arbitrary set. And then there is a known, an unknown distribution D. Uh, for example, we'd like to classify uh, cats versus dogs. And the goal is to really uh, be able to find predictors that are not only correct on the true examples coming from the distribution, but also correct on perturbations of these examples. So if the adversary is this, some arbit uh, this uh, green set, we would like to be correct um, on all uh, possible perturbations uh, of the cat and, and the dog. So uh, W star, for example, here is robustly correct uh, on the distribution, while W, the dashed uh, half space, is not robustly correct because it mis misclassifies some perturbations. And uh, more formally, if we have a hypothesis class H, uh, we say that we can robustly learn this hypothesis class if there is an algorithm uh, that can learn from finite uh, IID examples from the distribution, a predictor that achieves a robust error that is uh, at most epsilon worse from the best robust error we can achieve uh, using a hypothesis in the class H. So now uh, the main question that uh, I think we're still working on, um, I mean, in practice, uh, is how can we ensure that the population robust risk is small? So how can we ensure that we can actually generalize robustly to future uh, unseen test examples? So uh, a sensible approach uh, would be, which is what is typically done in standard supervised learning, let's just minimize the training error on the examples. Let's minimize. Uh, in the case of robust learning, let's minimize the robust loss uh, on the training examples. And this is uh, usually referred to as adversarial training. However, people have shown that in practice, there can be a large gap between the robust training error and the robust test error. Uh, for example, on CIFAR 10, this gap could be as large as um, like a robust error on training data that is close to 100%, while it's roughly 50% on a test data set. So it seems that uh, robust uh, or adversarial training by itself may not as actually guarantee us adversarial generalization. And we have actually shown in later work that uh, provably there are hypothesis classes that can't be robustly learned using just um, uh, adversarial training or any procedure that just minimizes a, uh, a ro the robust loss on the training data and indicating that we need really new principles for designing uh, robust learning algorithms. In particular, like in our work, we propose an ensemble technique. Um, so basically one, uh, like I, can, I think the major open question in this area is really, can we develop practical algorithms that can ensure adversarially robust generalization? And this actually may also, we may also have a different picture depending on the adversary U. For example, in practice, L infinity perturbations appear to be harder uh, than, for example, L2 perturbations. And so uh, it would be nice to like, have a complete picture of what, what, is, what can we do in, uh, in this, uh, for this problem. Uh, 
more technical open problems. Um, in our work, we showed that basically any hypothesis class that is learnable non-robustly, we can also robustly learn it, uh, but with uh, a, some like complex procedure that uses uh, adversarial training as a sub-procedure. Uh, the sample complexity of our learning rule uh, can be exponential in the VC dimension. And so an open question uh, is to show whether this uh, sample complexity is tight or whether it can be improved even further to maybe a polynomial dependence on the VC dimension or uh, even like tighter than that. Uh, another kind of direction that I'm interested in is um, asking like what operations on the adversary U or the perturbation sets that would be necessary and or sufficient to develop tractable robust learning algorithms. Uh, like in recent work, I've looked at um, questions where suppose that you only have access to a non-robust learning algorithm, could you use that algorithm to learn robust predictors? And uh, what access to the adversarial perturbations do we need to, for, in order to be able to do that? And uh, one specific model that I'm interested in is uh, a mistake oracle where you propose a predictor and an example, and then this oracle will tell you whether this predictor is robust on the example or with, will give you back a perturbation uh, uh, that the predictor is not robust on. So if you have access to such a mistake oracle, can you actually learn robust uh, learning, uh, I mean robust predictors? Um, we show that half spaces can be learned, like linear predictors can be learned robustly in this model, but um, I think it's it would be interesting to show, for example, if we can do this for other um, hypothesis classes and uh, uh, so that's it for my presentation. Thank you, uh, Omar, for bringing the learning theory uh, perspective. So uh, in the interest of time, we can move on and keep the question to the end. And the next speaker, we have Cyrus Rashtian from UCSD. He's a postdoctoral researcher working with Kamalika Chaudhuri. So Cyrus, please go ahead. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about something I've been uh, really interested in for the past few years, which is robustness and separation. Um, and so let me start by uh, talking about uh, what we call the robust analog of the Bayes optimal classifier. And so here you can think about a typical binary classification or multiple uh, multi-class classification setting. You have like two different regions. And the first observation is that the Bayes optimal classifier is actually undefined outside of the support of the distributions because you can essentially do anything. Um, and so we start by looking at, you know, instead, what if we have, um, you know, the, the best classifier in terms of both accuracy and robustness. And so what this means is that we uh, define something that we call the R optimal classifier, which is this orange line. Um, and specifically and intuitively, um, we are considering the classifier because we show that it maximizes accuracy at points uh, where it also robust to distance our perturbations. And so, you know, you, you want to be correct, but then you also want to be sort of invariant under uh, perturbations. And a little bit more formally, what is this uh, classifier? So let's say we have some uh, distribution on labeled examples uh, and we want to partition, and this is a sort of a geometric perspective on the Bayes optimal that also generalizes, you want to partition the instance space into C different subsets. And then for these subsets, you want to maximize, of course, the probability that you get the right label. Um, and so you can think of these different subsets as like, uh, you know, that's the label you're going to predict in that part of the space. For the robustness, we have an additional constraint, um, which is simple but important, is that we want to have these subsets be like well spread out in the space. Um, and so, you know, think about this as a norm space where geometrically uh, the subsets are going to be separated by some distance to R, where R is the perturbation radius you care about. Um, and then the R optimal classifier is just uh, a simple classifier where you can do essentially anything, but you have to predict the label um, J if you're close to region SJ, uh, which is the maximizer of one of the maximizers of this uh, optimization problem. And otherwise, you can do whatever you want. So if you're close to the region, you predict that label. Um, and so this is a, a strict generalization of the Bayes optimal classifier. If you set R equals zero, you get the Bayes optimal. Um, and so it's sort of a natural statistical learning theory generalization. Um, what we show is that uh, it, it also does in fact maximize the robust accuracy, which we call the astuteness. And so this is just the probability that you're correct and also in, uh, invariant under distance R perturbations. 
Um, and this theorem holds as long as your distance uh, is, is somewhat reasonable. So it holds for all norms. Um, it doesn't quite make sense to like talk about general metrics because what does a distance R even mean? But it's fairly general. Uh, and there's tons of open questions about this, which is why I'm talking. Uh, so first of all, you know, when do you actually converge to the R optimal classifier? What methods? Um, and so we know a little bit about this for KNN and some histogram classifiers, but like in general, uh, there's a ton of theory about the Bayes optimal. And so let's port it over essentially. Um, what are some like concrete distributions where we can really study this and show that, oh, you know, in fact, there's some separation. So like the Bayes optimal does this, but then the R optimal for a, a certain radius does something completely different. Or, you know, back to some of the previous questions, maybe, um, you know, the Lipschitz constant might be uh, really, really large uh, for the Bayes optimal, but then the R optimal, it's small. And so then, uh, you know, we really see like fundamentally different classifiers. Uh, so I think that's, uh, it's, it's a very cool object. It's very simple to analyze um, in terms of what we prove in our paper, uh, but there's tons more theory to be done about it. And then um, let me mention a slightly different uh, bent on this, which is why we got started on it, which is um, also why people care about the Bayes optimal in a lot of cases is because it's really useful for non-parametrics. Uh, and so first of all, um, there's tons of non-parametrics in the world, um, KNN, 1NN, decision trees, random forests. From my point of view, they just like, partition space into convex regions and predict on them. So it's like very geometric, uh, which makes it kind of nice. And we propose this kind of crazy idea defense that somehow works, which is called adversarial pruning. And so here's a normal one and N. And here's one where we just throw out some of the data and somehow it looks a lot more robust. So that's like one of the mysteries I want to explore. Concretely, we propose removing as few points as possible. So the classes have distance at least 2R. And so this sort of approximates the R optimal classifier in an intuitive sense. And then you just run some non-parametric algorithm. And so in practice, that works really well. And so that's uh, yet another, the fourth open question, let's say, uh, which is why does this work? You know, Why does throwing out data um, somehow lead these methods to create more robust classifiers? Empirically, it does, it does work very well. Uh, and then the other question, which I personally like, is that since these classifiers are really simple, like just ask all the robustness questions you can about them, because maybe we can just answer them. You know, for one and n, or for three and n, or like three tree random forests. You know, maybe we can get down to it. And so we propose some optimal attack algorithms, and I think a nice open question is also to find uh, attack algorithms with provable guarantees that like get close to the best possible adversarial examples. Um, the running times are not very good right now. I think they can probably be improved, definitely in practice, probably in theory. Um, I wanted to share a bunch of references. There's a bunch of papers that have been kind of exploring uh, this idea. This is not exhaustive. I'm sure I've missed people. The top two are our papers um, and then some other papers that are related for both non-parametrics and then the sort of optimal robustness type approach. Um, and so thanks, uh, feel free to contact me, email me or Twitter or whatever. Um, and briefly advertising the UCSD ML blog has a bunch of nice articles on these topics. So we've written a bunch of them. So you can check out that for more. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Cyrus, for uh, the nice talk. And I've actually read some of those blog posts and they're very cool. So uh, I recommend it, everybody to check them out. Um, great. So, and uh, our next to last speaker is Tongyang Zhang, a uh, postdoctoral fellow at the PPIC and uh, talking about robustness and generalization. Please, uh, Hongyang, you can go ahead. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, today I'm going to talk about an open problem related to the generalization of adversarial robustness. Uh, here in this talk, we discuss the LP norm theorem model. And I believe everyone here at least heard of this theorem model before. To give a quick recap, let's say we are given a blue point, which corresponds to a clean image of TTIC. And we add a small perturbation to this image and we get a perturbed image. Um, we restrict the, perturb the LP norm of the perturbation to be very small. So we human being cannot distinguish the clean image from the perturbed image. But for machine learning models such as deep neural network, the perturbation actually push the blue point to the other side of the design boundary and make a mistake. So the goal here is try to design a classifier which is correct for both perturbed and clean images. So before we move on to the open problem, let's first look at what's the current SOTA results for adversarial robustness. And here we take the CIFAR turn data sets, for example, under the eight intensity level attack. The current SOTA results was achieved very recently on October 2nd, 
by Paul et al. using the methodology of traits. And the architecture they use is y rest net 34 by 10, where the 34 is the depth of the neural network and 10 is the width of the neural network. On the CIFAR 10 test data sets, they achieve the clean accuracy roughly 85% and robust accuracy roughly 53% under the state-of-the-art attacking methods auto attack. And we can see that there is a huge gap here between the clean accuracy and robust accuracy. So the open problem is, can we achieve both high clean accuracy and good robust accuracy on the CIFAR 10 data sets? For example, both the clean accuracy and robust accuracy are larger than 80%. So I understand uh, this open problem might be a little bit challenging according to the current technique for adversarial defense, but there are two possible elements we can look at to uh, tackle this open problem. And the first one is about the gen optimization and the second one is about the generalization. So let's first look at the optimization. Uh, to, to do this, here we compare traits with PGD adversarial training and uh, uh, we report both the training, the accuracy on the training data sets and the accuracy on the test data sets. Uh, we can see that for PGD adversarial training, actually it does a very good job achieving almost perfect clean accuracy and robust accuracy on the training data sets. But at the same time, we can see on the test data set actually trace does not, does actually better. Although on the training data sets, the trace performance on robust accuracy is not very satisfactory, only 71%. So from this table, we can conclude that better training accuracy does not necessarily imply better test adversarial robustness. So maybe optimization is not the biggest issue for the vulnerability of current neural network. Then how about the generalization? To see the generalization here, um, we show a table by Common et al. in 2019, where they use the same methodology traits and the same architecture y res 34 by 10, but the difference difference is that in their methodology, they actually use actual unlabeled data. They use 10 times more actual unlabeled data. And with the help of actual data, they can indeed get some improvements for both the clean accuracy and the robust accuracy. But we can see the improvement is roughly 5%. Compared with our final goal, 80%, there is still a huge gap here. Then how about we further increase the model capacity, make the neural network even larger. And uh, that experiment was done by DeepMind very recently on October 7th. And they not only use the actual unlabeled data, but they also increase the depth of the neural network from 34 to 70, and increase the width of the neural network from 10 to 16. And indeed, increasing the model capacity can improve both the clean accuracy and robust accuracy. But we can see, uh, compared with the, this SODA results, 65%, there is still a huge gap here, uh, compared with the, our final goal, 80% robust accuracy on CIFA 10 data sets. So actually, there is a theoretical work showing a hardness results about the generalization of adversarial robustness. And here is a theorem. For, net, for any learning algorithm A and epsilon larger than zero, though, there will be a joint data distribution such that even when the data points of two classes are separated for at least one minus eight epsilon fraction of data points, if we require the clean error to be less than epsilon, then we need exponentially many data points in dimension D to learn such a class. So in other words, this theorem says that under the worst case data distribution, even if there is a classifier which is both accurate and robust, to learn such a classifier, one may need at least exponentially many data points in dimension D. So the next question is, how can we go beyond the worst case sample complexity? Can we leverage the nice data structure or nice data manifold to bypass this hardness result and get some improved sample complexity bound? But I will leave that as a future open problem for all of you. And that's all for my talk. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much for you know, this interesting perspective connecting theory and practice. And uh, our last speaker is uh, Sohail Faisi, who is a 
assistant professor of computer science at the University of Maryland and one of the most active junior uh, researchers in the area. Please go, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thanks everyone for being here. I'll try to go quick to have some time for uh, open uh, discussions. So today I'm going to talk about generalizable and provable adversarial robustness. Uh, so by provable, we mean that the model output should remain uh, constant in a neighborhood around uh, or input X. And let me kind of, you know, give a big picture of provable defenses that exist. So we can categorize them based on the amount of the network information used in the defense. So the attack is a white box attack, but we'll categorize them based on the amount of the network information in the defense. So against LP threat models, we have two extremes. In one extreme, we have randomized smoothing based defenses that basically they use the output of the networks and they are very scalable defenses to deep models and complex data sets like ImageNet. On the other extreme, we have some provable defenses that they use high order information from the network like curvatures and they perform well on smaller networks, but they are not uh, extendable to uh, deep models and large data sets at the moment. So one open uh, question is how we can have uh, defenses that they use high order information from the network, but also uh, extendable to deep models and uh, complex data sets. So we also need to uh, think about non-LP threat models, right? So we have seen different examples in this workshop, uh, but there are some provable defenses um, uh, for sparse threat models, for Washington threat model that look into spatial transformations of the images on patch threat models. But there, I, I believe there are uh, still a lot of um, interesting techniques can be adopted from LP to non-LP threat models. And there may be some techniques that we need to specifically develop for non-LP threat models. All right. But the key assumption on all of these results is that the defender knows the threat model used by the attacker. But this is not going to be the case in practice because adversary by definition won't follow the threat model that is being used in the defense. So in order to understand this problem, we need to think about generalization of these defenses to unforeseen attacks. Unfortunately, some popular defenses like adversarial training doesn't show good generalization to unforeseen attacks. These are some uh, experiments on CIFAR-10. Uh, for instance, you can see if I adversarially uh, train against L-infinity and I evaluate against L2, I have a significant drop in my performance. If I evaluate against a spatial attack, I'll have even more uh, drop in my uh, performance. So in order to understand this problem, we need to think about relationship between threat models. All right, so think about this blue uh, set as the set of all imperceptible adversarial examples for an input. So we don't have a mathematical characterization for this set. So what we do in practice, we uh, basically uh, formulate some restrictive threat models like LP, spatial patch, and try to fill this in using these restricted threat models. And we hope that eventually if I have a model that is robust against union of these threat models will be fine. But there are still plenty of examples, imperceptible examples that are not included in the uh, even union of these threat models. And that basically our model will be still vulnerable against those, um, uh, those examples. So here I'm proposing a new view to this problem. Instead of a bottom-up approach, I'm proposing a top-down view to this problem to directly approximate the set of imperceptible examples using a neural network itself. So this is what we call neural perceptual threat model, NPTM, uh, that aims to approximate the whole blue set uh, using a deep model. And obviously we'll have uh, several challenges. What are the proper neural perceptual distances that we should use? The attack is going to be more complex. The defense has a new frontal vulnerability. So I won't go into the details. So you can uh, look at the uh, recent papers that we have posted uh, on archive to um, you know, uh, see some of these challenges and how we deal with these problems. Okay, so let me just show some example attacks using the perceptual threat model. This is the original image. And this is the adversarial perturbations of this image. And as you can see, 
basically uh, the adversarial example is generated by changing the lighting or if you look at this part uh, the, the kind of the strings is uh, changed from uh, from a chain to a string uh, in order to mislead the model and these are done automatically because of this uh, neural perceptual threat model and there are some other examples uh, here okay so some results on image net 100 uh, so here again we are interested in generalization to unforeseen threat models and we are looking at the union of the attacks and the unseen mean. And as you can see, adversarial training using the perceptual uh, threat model that we propose significantly improves uh, uh, in terms of the generalization to unforeseen attacks. And I want to emphasize we have one attack, perceptual attack, that is really, really strong. Even if we do adversarial training against this perceptual attack, it doesn't really improve. So uh, if you have a defense and you think it is really uh, strong, uh, you should check it out against this attack. And the last slide is uh, basically here we show the set of vulnerable examples to uh, different attacks. Uh, let's say L2, a special and neural perceptual attack. And as you can see, the NPTM threat model encompasses both uh, examples that are vulnerable against L2 and a special, but it also has examples that is not included in any of, uh, any of these threat models. And that's why we see a good generalization to uh, unforeseen attacks. And that's it. Happy to take questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Sohail. Um, so right now we will, uh, you can take questions to anybody, but uh, one thing I wanted to do is because there's been um, uh, so many presentations, uh, maybe I will just give a one minute summary of everything um, and uh, then you know, we can take a question. Right, so just uh, because we've seen so many great presentations, here's a very brief summary of everything. So roughly speaking, we had two uh, types of um, uh, um, topics. Uh, one of them, uh, roughly speaking, in the area of uh, learning with distance-based attacks. So Sebastian talked about the law of robustness. So is, uh, does robustness, let's say, in a form of a small Lipschitz constant require uh, over parameterization somehow fundamentally? Uh, Jing Goy talked about a number of things, including the question of whether there is a robustness accuracy trade-off, and if so, what causes it, uh, and some experiments showing that there may not be one, uh, and it may be due to the algorithms that we uh, use that could be suboptimal, or they may, it may be due to the so-called stably uh, uh, or unstably classified examples. Uh, more discuss some learning theory questions about the optimal central complexity of robust fact learning and also how to learn with mistake uh, oracles that give us some information about uh, locally at every point, whether there are, uh, whether it's possible to perturb them. Cyrus talked about a number of things, including uh, our optimal classifiers and uh, connections to more classical notions and algorithms, and also uh, com comparing parametric and non-parametric uh, uh, methods. Um, Hong Yang asked if we can achieve high, clean uh, accuracy and good robust accuracy on some standard uh, state of the art, uh, well, on some standard data sets, and uh, how can we go beyond the worst case sample complexity models? Then, beyond the simple uh, distance scale uh, robustness, Mika, uh, Mika asked about how we can use adversarial attacks for some good or social, social societal good uh, purposes, for instance, to help a domain generalization, fingerprinting, or meta learning. Zico asked about what happens uh, and how to move beyond simple robustness uh, with realistic models. Uh, Aditi talked about achieving general robustness and richer sources of supervision. Alex also talked about uh, being robust about natural auto distribution shift in data. John talked about low uh, dimensional models and how to be robust against, uh, how to be robust in that setting in a uh, kind of more the classical sense, possibly of robustness. And so Hale in the last talk talked about uh, using, uh, how to use scalable, uh, how to scale and use high order network information for provable defenses, as well as also better threat models, specifically this neural perceptual threat model. So I have here up um, kind of each of the, um, you know, the, the, the topics. And now I would like to, um, so originally the session was until 1.30, uh, 
but we have a, there's a 15 uh, minute break afterwards. So I'm certainly around so we can have maybe, um, at, you know, 20, 25 minute discussion. Um, so please, anybody who has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. So hell, sorry for not uh, actually reading this paper first and asking questions and I'm sure I can answer by reading it. Sure. But for your neural perceptual lessons, how, how do you train the perceptual model? Uh, great. So uh, we have uh, two types of training uh, for the uh, you know perceptual adversarial training. One is you have a pre-trained uh, perceptual network. Uh, let's say you take AlexNet or you take you know ResNet uh, and use that as your constraint. Uh, but the one that actually works well is that the network itself, the classification network itself, use is being used as the perceptual uh, network as well. So we have one classification network and one network for the perceptual distance. So they can be different, but they can be the same. And basically we have tried with both of them uh, in all experiments we see that if basically the network that is being used for the classification is also used for the perceptual uh, threat model that actually provides a slightly better uh, performance, but more or less both of them, they perform pretty well. But I guess I, 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 don't, I don't quite follow. So, but just in terms of the actual training process, I mean, what do you use to train perceptual similarity? Like what's your, what's your loss function on that? On that? Oh, perfect. So uh, basically we use the LPIPS distance, uh, which is uh, if you look at the um, uh, activations of the neurons, and basically there are some normalizations, you get like this, you know, phi of X. And then if you look at the L2 distance between phi of X and phi of X prime, so that's the perceptual distance. Oh. You know, you can either do like a, a projected uh, perceptual uh, gradient descent, like PPGD as a constraint, or you can add as a Lagrangian in your objective and have a Lagrangian perceptual attack, uh, similar to like Carlini and Wagner's attack. Mm -hmm. I think I better read the paper to fully get what it, get it, but it's all good. How is it related to non-transferable attacks? I mean, it feels like you have these two networks, you want an attack, which one yeah. network doesn't detect and the other one detects? Uh, that, that's a good question. So uh, my concern at the beginning was that because we are adding this constraint using another neural network, that may actually open up another uh, front of vulnerability because I can, uh, basically attack the threat model, uh, create some examples that may, uh, my threat model may not include. Um, so we have done some uh, human uh, perceptual studies and we basically, at least from like that point of view, we see that it's a pretty good approximation of the uh, uh, imperceptible uh, sets, but we don't have a theoretical guarantee saying that uh, it is a, you know, if you attack the threat model, uh, would you be basically be able to circumvent this type of defense that we have? I'm not sure if I am, I address your question. Um, My question was more like you have these two neural networks. One of them decides what is the threat and the other one is, you know, the one that you really want to test. Yes. So now, do I understand correctly is that you make a perturbation and what you want is a threat model tells you, okay, this perturbation, it doesn't affect at all my prediction. So it's a valid perturbation. Yes but you want that on the other neural network, it's bad. Yes. So, it, so isn't it exactly uh, uh, an adversarial example that does not transfer? Like it does uh, not transfer from one model to the other. Okay, that's a great point. Uh, I think that's correct, uh, but we have two ways of training this. One is like, say if one network by itself is fixed, uh, let's say you use AlexNet and that basically tells you if your perturbation is valid or not. And that basically will relate to the transferability of these uh, attacks. But the other one that performs slightly better is that both of these networks are basically optimized during training. So even the uh, network that tells me if a perturbation is valid or not, uh, during the training, it is being optimized. So it is not a fixed network to uh, think about just the transferability of the attacks. Thanks. So, uh, so hey, um a uh, question, can you go beyond the transformations that you have considered right now and consider more general like human semantic similarities? Oh, absolutely. So we are actually thinking about this right now. Uh, 
you know, because this is like for the adversarial robustness, uh, but, uh, you know, similar ideas can be used for, you know, uh, more natural robustness, you know, um, you know, some of this stuff that you guys have been talking. So yeah, definitely. Okay, great. So actually, um, to help kind of facilitate the discussion, um, you know, I mean, I, I certainly have a lot of questions for each of the speakers, separately, this is super exciting, but I also have some kind of higher level questions. So maybe, you know, I put them here in the slides. So uh, one uh, higher level question was like, what's the right rule for robustness beyond the distance-based perturbations? And I think we talked a lot already about this. And uh, so maybe we can discuss possibly some of the other ones. Um, so the second question that I kind of, I, I was thinking about is, you know, there, there are obviously like trends, right? And, you know, the community starts realizing what, what are the important problems and then, you know, kind of people move in some direction and you can see, you know, the, trend, the paper is coming up. So maybe for like newcomers, it would, it would be interesting to some of the experts here to talk about what they see uh, if they if they uh, want to reveal this uh, information, uh, what they, what they see as some of the underappreciated questions, something that you know people are not yet thinking about, but could be important to think about. So if, if anybody wants to share their uh, opinion on that, and you're asking tough questions. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> if if we if you don't know this, or if if, if nobody kind of no no clear. Point, then uh, maybe you can ask some start with some simple simpler simpler kind of questions so well, i actually have another question which is like for well okay first of all let me let me wait if somebody else wants to try let me actually speak to number four because i think this is a great this is a great topic number four okay number four yeah so people people <laughs> often motivate robustness in terms of um including myself i should say it motivate robustness in terms of the need for safe application of, of ML methods to, to safety critical situations. Um, and I think, I mean, it's unclear to me that this law, this is really a sound, a sound argument, right? Because um, if you have a safety critical scenario, like, you know, control of some autonomous system is operating in an environment where it can kill people, it doesn't, doesn't work. Um, you're never going to be able to enumerate the threat model in the way that you actually want to to, to guarantee safety in, in the realistic sense. It's just not it's just not really possible. And we're talking about different things here. But I think is actually this is actually a, a, an important point too, because what is true is that there are a lot of domains, especially going back to just things like robust control, where in lower dimensional settings you actually can very well define you know perturbation regions or or uh, disturbances that are allowed for a, for a dynamical system that actually do tell you, say, if, you know, do give you a sort of a practical guarantee of safety if I can guarantee that this system will work well within these bounds here. This is how they, you know, this is how controllers on, on aircraft and such are certified, right? Um, and, and we don't really think about these things typically in robustness. We think about high dimensional vision problems, right? But I actually suspect that some of the first applications of these things are gonna be in much lower dimensional, more control-like settings um, where, where those things are already kind of adopted in, in frameworks of robust control. And we may be able to improve performance by having more complex controllers, but where we can still guarantee some degree of, of, of robustness in the formal sense that we're talking about it here. So I, I think that it's that, that number four also hints at the fact that we may need to be thinking about very different settings um, than vision when we talk about sort of practical applications here. So uh, yeah, uh, Zico, I, I can add to that. I think uh, Chong's presentation you know, like, um, is probably um, uh, symbolized very well with what you just said, right? Um, you know, first of all, if we we're talking about uh, adversarial, so we're sort of applying against mine, in my point of view, right? So the, we don't know what features extracted from the neural networks to classify different images. And uh, if there, there, it just happened to extract very sensitive features out of many that can describe in those classes, this is one. Second, that we're actually considering the worst possible perturbations to that. Uh, I just really hope uh, some of us just go to the real world, ask really what industry or application people, what kind of notion of robustness. I think, Zico, you touched upon that a little bit in your introduction, right? They may have unrealistic, either they have very unrealistic, uh, uh, you know, have a very practical robust, meaning that I may not care about the case attack. I care about with high probability guarantee, 
most of the natural cases, um, my system will function normally, right? That's a much more realistic and actually I think a more, um, uh, you know, useful uh, um, notion of robustness. This is one end of the spectrum, really the what notion of robustness we should talk about. The second is really about the low dimensionality. You know, I trained as a control series. Um, I studied the robust control as a graduate student, right? There the notion is we always only talk about it against a very clear structure. Is a point on the line or not? Okay, if you look at the most prevalent robust uh, techniques used in computer vision, used, it's always, such as, such as the RAN seconds one, it's always, always about against a no dimensional model. Data lies on a no dimensional subspace, line, or some manifold. The clear notion. Then you talk about the perturbation. How can I make my estimation, make my decision making against perturbation that are incoherent to the no dimensional subspaces, so no dimensional structures? Nothing else, right? Otherwise, the notion of Robustness is not even well defined. If I have a two overlapping distribution, what's the notion of robustness, right? So first of all, I think the problem needs to be well defined. And in signal processing, you know, I think Tom touched upon right, the notion of robustness that since from the day very early, Boscovich uh, L1 minimization, and also the, the Ben Nogan, and then later on Terence Tan and Manny Candice is always about the separation problem. If you want to get a good graceful trade-off, between robustness and actual accuracy, you must have this characterize the incoherence, how your perturbation related to the structure or model class you're interested. Here, if we're not clear even about the features, the distribution actually learned by the neural networks, and then also consider worst case perturbation, I'm just wondering, are we having a well-defined problem here? That's just my personal you know, uh, follow-up on Zeko's uh, Question, uh, uh, you know, discussion. Maybe I can say one thing about number two. I don't know if it's underappreciated, but certainly I think most of us have the intuition that, uh, you know, the, the weakness of adversarial examples is related to generalizations in some way. Um, like the fact that basically those neural networks do not generalize, but it would be. I still don't really understand whether there is a formal connection there. So, you know, many, many works on generalization, what they have done is related to robustness of the training process. Like you generalize if your process does not depend too much on any particular training example. But adversarial robustness is robustness of test time. You want to know if you move a little bit, you know, your test example, you, you want to say that the, the answer does not move too much, but this seems, the, the generalization of robustness at test time to generalization is almost tautological. I mean, it is almost by definition generalization. So I don't understand whether it's just a tautology or if there is some deeper mathematical fact there. I think that's that's an interesting direction. I mean, in the specific context of two layers neural network, what I know like mathematically very concretely is that you can have an upper bound on the generalization, which is the Rademacher complexity. And you can have an upper bound on the robustness, which is this upper bound that I talked about uh, uh, on the Lipschitz constant that depends on the spectral norm on the, of the weights. And you can relate those two upper bounds. But these are just upper bounds. So what is really fundamentally going on? Uh, and is there anything non-trivial to be said there? I don't know. Yeah, I think related to that is um basically this notion of maybe like lipschitzness but uh, with respect to the support of the distribution that you care about so yeah um i think really yeah adversarial robustness is enforcing lipschitzness on points that are in the support of this the distribution and the trick is figuring out um yeah where should you place the balls with the constant labels um but we, we can consider a setting where, for instance, the support is just like the sphere, for instance. Mm -hmm. Then you just want to be like Lipschitz on the sphere, let's say. Oh, then then I guess, um, um, yeah, then I guess the question would be, what is the best achievable robustness with a network from this class? Uh, it may not be really that high. And I think that's also a good point. 
um, like, yeah, what is if the infimum of the best predictor in our class is actually really bad and in terms of robust uh, error? And um... yeah, I guess I had like a related comment. So I think some of these things like really depend like how, like you must said on like what we define as the distribution that we're interested in. Like for example, like this particular question of like generalization versus robustness, you could imagine very different answers depending on whether it's say like a uniform distribution over the sphere or you have like a very heavy tail kind of distribution. Because if you have something that's very heavy tail, you can create a lot of difference between sort of extrapolation in terms of like you see one point from some, you know, subpopulation and how well you do on the rest versus robustness because robustness is asking for something very low Local, but like so that could change how you like extrapolate globally and so that kind of extrapolation becomes important when you have this heavy tail distribution but if you're like in a sphere and like things are kind of well sampled then it seems like you know this uh, this distinguishing factor is not present so it feels like we really need to understand like what is the data distribution that we're trying to model and I feel like we're somewhat in trouble because if we could model like say vision or whatever application, you know, reasonably well, then like we've kind of solved the task that we're trying to do itself. So sort of what's the right level of abstraction at which we need to understand the distribution that we are not like asking for something impossible uh, in terms of modeling. So I feel like that's one thing that I'm not sure like, and it feels like even the most of the work on generalization and trying to understand it theoretically doesn't pay too much attention to sort of like what's the right data distribution to think about like we focus on things that are analyzable but maybe we also want to think about what captures the actual distributions in practice like so one comment that i had and i also had a comment related to four like one thing it feels like maybe we're expecting too much from systems and right now it's like we want to get ml systems that are good enough but maybe we want to like do the reverse question is like can you understand what what you could hope from the systems and then change sort of the way humans interact or the way people actually deploy these systems, right? Like, so if I had a better characterization of, you know, when I can actually trust the system, then I'm, you know, I, I can take over accordingly or something like that. So maybe that like, whether we could get techniques to like actually probe what neural networks do when well and not, and then sort of modify our usage, that could be another perspective on how to, uh, you know, deploy systems in the wild without being intractable completely. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add uh, uh, some points to this great discussion. Um, so I think as Zico mentioned, there are also some interesting problems not beyond classification. For instance, you can think about robustness of your explanation signal or your interpretation signal, uh, even though if your label is correctly uh, predicted. Uh, even you can think about robustness of fairness, right? So you can think about robustness biases that your data may uh, have if you are, if you have a, some subpopulations in your data, maybe like they are more sensitive to uh, some perturbations. So uh, these are also interesting problems. So another, I think, suggestion or another uh, problem that may be uh, of interest is, you know, whether or not if we, we always think that, okay, images, they live on a kind of quote unquote low dimensional manifold. Uh, if you know, we have, for instance, the exact manifold characterization of these images, how can we use that information and whether or not that would provide some additional gains for us in, the, in, um, uh, in adversarial robustness? Uh, just this, you know, a quick advertisement. So we have actually crafted an unmanifold image net uh, for a uh, NURIPS paper that we have. So that may actually be a good starting point that saying that, okay, now what if I have exactly the manifold information? Are there some variations to these you know, techniques in terms of you know, attacks and defenses that I can leverage that manifold information and see uh, if that would be uh, useful or not? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to add a little about this. Um, I, I think the so far the worst uh, uh, robustness, I think one uh, for the under approaching approach, I think uh, the in, in uh, our infinity LP uh, attack, um, it's it's good has its own merits, but the most of the case, especially for application computer vision, um, 
we still struggling to get the system uh, about the very natural perturbation, which actually is far from, it will create small perturbation will create a huge L1, LP, or whatever the distance in the metric space, such as a small deformation of the image, translation, rotation, um, and scaling. And it's been, you know, been uh, empirically uh, very salient that we don't, the, the, the current systems, we are not even, you can even find a very small deformation among those categories can be to the, there are actually adversarial examples for those deformations. And yet they do not fall into this uh, small L infinite ball. Usually they will create the distance will be huge. So I just wondering that, uh, you know, any of the techniques or um, uh, from this can be formulated to deal with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, small in perceptual sense, but a large in terms of pixel space. Yeah, so I think I can, yeah some, some of the work from uh, Sohiel and uh, maybe Zico and Alex, I think this is roughly speaking, as, as far as I understand, this is what they're getting at, right? If they're going in this direction. Yeah, I, I can speak to this a little bit as well. I mean, one of the reasons that we kind of generally are thinking about like data in terms of these like models of natural variation that I was talking about is because they could represent any kind of deformation of the data that you want. For example, you could like use a rotation matrix in there. And like, I think the kind of valuable thing about thinking these about these like rotations and these things that you brought up is that these actually do have the low dimensional structure that we're looking for, right? Like if you think about rotation about a single, you're, you're just thinking about like a one dimensional parameter, which like vis-a-vis as adversarial examples, you know, where you have to do optimization in the data space, now you can do optimization um, kind of in the low dimensional space and think about kind of the push forward through this model that you're viewing your data through. So I think like there's an opportunity here when we like find ways like Sohel was saying of like quantifying exactly the data manifold, especially if it lives in a low dimensional space, like the optimization that we end up doing to find kind of worst case examples might actually become quite uh, a bit easier um, because uh, the space that we're searching over is, is greatly reduced. So I think that that's one direction that like kind of this way of quantifying how data lives on these manifolds, like we'll, we'll kind of push this forward is how to take advantage of this structure in the actual optimization. Yeah, so I, I just want to point out a fact, right? So in computer vision, the by far, you know, the most used the robust techniques is ransack. I think I really recommend everybody to take a close look, right? It's been practiced for 30 years, almost used everywhere uh, in computer vision, 3D reconstruction, and rec pattern recognition, right? That's, and uh, I think there are some very general principles behind it, the reasons behind it. The, the, the structure, no dimensionality of the model structure plays a com completely essential role. And also even the, 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 it provides the right kind of robustness for many of the problems that people encounter in practice. That just, uh, you know, but I do see there's a dramatic deviation from what currently we're talking about, that kind of robustness in neural networks from, from this, this, a little bit disconnect to this practice. And also the notion of robustness that have been practiced or prevailed in, in system theory that uh, uh, Zeko has mentioned earlier as well. So we need to sort of justify. I think there's some re-justifications needed uh, as a community or as a, you know, we move on and what, let, what type of the robustness we should be really uh, defined or, and also under make the problem well-defined, meaning that, uh, you know, what is uh, the robustness against what, right? What really we want robust it against what? Right? So that's, that's just my two, two cents. Absolutely. Thank you okay. very much to all of the speakers and attendees. Please feel free to, uh, you know, uh, contact us later with your questions and so on. We will uh, think about uh, compiling this into some documents. Thanks, everybody. And, uh...